back, the White House has been plunged into fresh turmoil by a report claiming that Donald Trump revealed classified information to the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, during an Oval Office meeting last week. Joining us with that story and others making the news this morning are today at events, Gavin Riley and Director of the Irish Academy of Public Relations, Ellen Goyle. Uh, good morning to you both. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I, I, it's, it's, it's a bit, I suppose, possibly slightly facetious and a broad stroke, but there are three major names uh, constantly in the spotlight circuit for the last week or two. And uh, you, you would have to ask, with what's happened to them and the way they're dealing with their jobs, how long can they keep those jobs? So we'll start with, uh, with Mr. Trump. We'll get on to Noreen O'Sullivan and then finally Andy Kenny uh, at the end of it. So that's the theme of this morning. Uh, I mean, Ellen, like you've seen what's happened with James Cole. Now he's, he's having high level discussions with uh, the Russian foreign minister and he reveals a source which could have been damaging to America's interests. You just can't do that kind of thing continuously and get away with it. I think the most worrying thing that the President Trump said was he, he said something like, I get great intel, I get great intel every day. And that was the nub of it for me. The man is in a very powerful position. He should get great intel every day about everything that's happening everywhere. But accountants get great intel. Lawyers get great intel. PR people get great intel. Journalists get great intel. But they actually know what to do with it and how to use it responsibly. And I think my worry with this, uh, on this occasion is that he has all of the information. He doesn't seem to understand if the story is true, how to use it responsibly. Mm. There's information that you can share, information that you can. It's back to the Americans, known, great known knowns and known, unknown unknowns. But really it's about how responsibly do you use the information. It's not a game of, I know something I can share with you. He, he can't, he's, he doesn't seem to be able to resist um, the impulse to boast, to show off, to do that, my daddy's bigger than your daddy. I mean, okay, on one level, I, I, I say that to people, you might smirk or laugh or think I'm, I'm being facetious here. But that's what he's doing, and he's, you know, the, the most powerful man. But yeah. that's actually, that's the perception from the outside, that if he knows something, he feels he has to tell you about it. He wants to be the man in charge all the time, and be seen to be the man in charge all the time by sharing information with you, which is not actually how politics is played. And no. everything about how he approaches everything that was competition, like even again, if you take Russia as an example, then very early in the presidency, when Russia started announcing plans to upgrade its nuclear arsenal, and you would have thought that once you have a certain amount of news, that that's enough, because once they work, you really only need to have a certain amount to have the entire globe covered, and you don't need any more than that. But Russia announces plans to upgrade, and then he immediately says, oh, we have to upgrade, because there's no way of allowing someone else with a bigger nuclear arsenal than we have. And it's just, it's always about this, this constant, this bravado, this need to be the biggest. And what's worrying about this particular instance is that it seems that the information that was shared with Sergei Lavrov, if that is true, it's the sort of intel that even America doesn't share with its own allies. And the difficulty that they put in there is that we don't know what which country this intel actually came from. It's not state. Let's say, for example, that it's Israel because it relates to the Middle East. So Israel would be a fairly good guess. This is now possibly compromising an asset in a particular city. And given uh, Russia's allegiance to the Assad regime in Syria, you can be fairly sure that that uh, asset may already have been compromised or possibly killed because it might suit Russia to not have someone feeding America information that Russia itself doesn't have. So that, those are the kind of stakes that you're playing with. And then if you, you lose an asset in a place like that, that's years of intelligence work gone down the drain. And the whole point of having great intel is all well and good if you immediately cut off the source of it. We, we over here would be accused of all you, all, all you, you know, woolly liberal uh, media types in, in, in Europe, you all hate it, you don't get it, you don't understand, uh, well, you know, um, the American uh, psyche and how we feel about ourselves and how he's making us feel about ourselves. But there's a, a, an American, there's a Runyonism. Damon Runyon, the American writer, said, look, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, or walks like a duck, the chances are it's a duck. The Russian connection is a scandal that will not go away, Ellen. I mean, you, you had the Paul Manafort thing, you had uh, Mike Flynn, you had James Comey sacked while he was asking for more money to do more investigating into the Russian thing. And then, of course, there's Rex Tillerson, who, you know, personal friend of Putin and all the rest of it. So the connections are, I mean, that's more than coincidence. And people should be suspicious. The President of the United States should not be that cosy with the President of Russia. The President of the United States shouldn't be that cosy with Russians generally or any other country generally. His job, and he keeps saying that his job is to protect the American people, he has the best interests of the American people at heart. I don't think he, if that's his game, he's not playing his game very well. He's actually creating, he's allowing this perception to continue to build 
that he's very close to the Russians. If he's not, he needs to put space between himself and the Russians. If he is, he needs to say why. But the problem is that nobody is actually sure what on earth is going on, and it doesn't seem that he's behaving in the best interests of the American people. Okay. Certainly that wouldn't be their take, and it wouldn't be our take in Europe. Okay, uh, let's move on to Noreen O'Sullivan. Uh, okay. Gavin, in any other era or circumstances, she would have gone Moscow. Mm. Um, uh, there's an almost daily litany of revelations, um, all of them bad, and at, 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 at worst bad, at, at best just undermining. It's, it's like a death by 2,000 cuts. Yeah. <laughs> Why are they sticking by it? Uh, because the spec is they have no other option, because to, to lose one commissioner will be seen as uh, unfortunate, but to lose two will be seen as de terribly careless. And when this is a party that's meant to be the party of law and order, Fine Gael, the idea that they would lose two guard commissioners for various unspaced and various... But that's the only reason, de facto, it, it, is, is she not so damaged by that that... You know, her job is completely yeah, the point that they've sucked so much political capital into her that they have to stick by her through thick and thin now. But certainly, you're right to say that any other commissioner would be in, in seriously hot water. Because if you take, for example, with the circumstance under which Noreen O'Sullivan was given the job in the first place, and she immediately came out with all these very kind, encouraging words about how whistleblowers were a valued part of the force that had to be encouraged, that they needed to be cherished and listened to, and generally embraced. And since then, you have, aside from the, the Mars McKay scandal, which is now the, separate, the subject of a, a full tribunal, and her own press officer going against her in that regard. You have the head of HR who completely contradicted her at the PAC two weeks ago about the extent of a meeting the two of them had had. You have the head of audit who says that not only was he excluded from the inquiries into Templemore, but that he uh, disowned himself from the figures around the breath tests. They were presented as an audit. He said, well, they weren't an audit because I had nothing to do with them. And then separately, you have the guy who's meant to be the head of data accuracy who said that when his name was put to a review of homicide cases, that wasn't fair because he hadn't seen that report either. So you have this series of cases where Norton O'Sullivan is saying, if you have wrongdoing to expose, by all means, come to me, we will make it work, you are a valued, important thing. And yet when loads of people then continually do that, it seems that they are just given the cold shoulder and dramatically excluded, even by the current commissioner. But there's no legacy difficulties here that these are people who were already on the fringes. The current regime has seen these people being put out to one side. And when you consider the whole ticket on which Noreen O'Sullivan was put there in the first place. You, that, you would think that would make her position untenable before you even get into the, the phone tapping revelations of the last weekend. And not to mention Temple Moore, which has been behaving more like St. Trinian's than it was the police academy. And she's sitting on that for how many months? Do you know, it's a very strange thing. I'm not a fan of off with their heads at all. And I actually found myself wondering, if Noreen O'Sullivan is removed, who takes over? Somebody else Bring who would the guard in, probably. Who, would, who actually is head of a corp force that has the same culture. I think there's a, a corporate governance problem within the Gardaí, and I think there's a cultural problem. And I would much rather see Noreen O'Sullivan stay and see two people put, shadowing her, working with her, constantly saying, no, this is how it should be done. Let's change from the inside out. Ellen, so if they can do it with the PSNI, which is in a far worse mess than... I know ours looks bad at the moment, but far worse mess in our garden shape on it ever worth. They can, if Chris Patton can do it up there, then we can certainly do it down There is one catcher point to that, though, and it does kind of relate to that. The Patton Commission took the guts of nearly four years to kind of bring to fruition where they said, these are the structures that don't work, this is what you need to change. The root and branch review that they're discussing in Cabinet today is kind of aimed at that kind of whole process. Should we have a single force that's responsible for policing and detention. Well, they need to separate Sorry. policing and security. So, but they, they basically, there is no point in getting rid of a commissioner until they've done that, because part of the reason why you're currently restricted to internal candidates is that only an internal candidate can run both okay. policing and intelligence. And so very the other us. side of the argument is that she is of the Gardaí, so she should know best how to change it. Okay, uh, or how to protect it. Go ahead. <laughs> right, I said that, that not you. Okay, that's um, uh, uh, and Kenny, uh, like, what the hell is he playing at? He's supposed to be telling us this week when he's going to go, give us the departure date, but uh, no, sorry, I'm off to Chicago for a trade mission. What a super card player. He obviously has decided <laughs> he is going to go whenever he's good and ready to go, and everybody can sit by and wait. And what I find fascinating is that everybody else will sit by and let him choose. I don't know why nobody has said, actually, I want to be leader, and I'm going to make my move now. If Finn Gale seemed to believe that this is a polite old boys club. I'm not so sure that it is. It's not politics as we know it and it's not a great game to watch. It's, it's actually very boring to wait until he's ready yes. to go. It's a bit of a slow bicycle race. The toughest, the cutest, the smartest of them all, Gavin? 
Possibly so. I've never known anyone to make so much capital out of a heave against him seven years ago, but that appears to be the situation that we're in now because everyone is afraid to wield the knife in case they're not the one that wears the crown afterwards. But I think, ultimately, the only people who know what he's going to do are the man himself and Fanua Kenny, and anyone else hasn't been what he's up to, and we'll only really find out tomorrow. And I dare say, when I say we'll find out tomorrow, we might not actually might. find out tomorrow. We might find out a few weeks from tomorrow. No one knows that. On that note, on that note, political correspondent, <laughs> no one knows anything. And you are supposed to be the best of the brightest. Speak truth to power. <laughs> Thank you. Well, very much indeed. Let us know your thoughts on any of these topics. You can text AM followed by your comments to 5312 or email around MTV3.ie, Facebook or Twitter.